I've studied the last 500 years of history and cycles, and these things repeat over and over again. Large wealth gaps with large values gaps at the same time as there's a lot of debt and there's an economic downturn produces conflict and vulnerability. And that will be with us unless the economy is good for most people. Most people could be productive and effective and benefit. I was asked to talk about uh, bubbles. You know, is the market in a bubble, stock market in a bubble, what's in a bubble? And I just wanted to give you some thoughts about that. And I've got about 10 minutes to do it. And so I want to be quick. A bunch of years ago, I started to think about, well, what is a bubble? What What do I mean when I have a bubble? Because I watched a lot of bubbles over my something like 50 years of investing. And I basically think, uh, thought there were six things that made a bubble in my mind, and I'm going to rattle them off, then I'll apply them so that you know what I think. First, uh, you know, how how high are prices relative to the traditional measures of um, prices is a consideration. For example, you know, are PEs high or yields uh, low and that kind of thing. That's a consideration, but it, I, it's not what I mean by a bubble. Let's let's say, for example, you can have prices high, which means returns low, and you can have that go on for a very long time. That doesn't mean a bubble pops. So I'm really looking at whether you get a pop, but still, it's an ingredient. So, for example, let's say if we were to take the bond yields, the bond yields are um, extremely low levels. And so say, think about bonds as having a multiple, the multiples of bonds are, you know, like 75 times earnings or something, depending on what bond market you're uh, operating in. And so when stocks compete with bonds, they're competing with low returns. And so it's not uh, uh, unreasonable to think that the stock market could have a multiple of 50 times if bonds have a 75 time multiple, why can't bonds? Uh, and that means a low return. So that's one of the considerations, but it's not all. The second is prices are discounting unsustainable conditions. So unsustainable starts to be part of this picture of a bubble. Uh, unsustainable means that by the nature of the buying, whoever is doing the buying and how have that supply demand, that means that that won't be sustained and that produces a correction or prices going down. And then it, it, there's this speculative element, number three. So one of those measures of the speculative elements is new buyers in the market. They're attracted in the market. You know, it's the sort of thing where, you know, you go to a cocktail party and people who are never involved in the thing are investing in it. And that could be tech stocks and it could be real estate and whatever. But, you know, they're drawn in and that there's a big bullish sentiment. So everybody wants it. not having these things makes you feel dumb, that kind of thing. And then also number five on my list is big purchases, uh, forward purchases. You know, like if somebody's buying apartments that they don't own because they think that the apartments are going to go up or back in the days where I traded a lot of commodities, I would watch that those who used commodities would rather than buy from hand to mouth, they would get a lot of forward coverage. In other words, buy inventory to protect themselves against the prices going up. And so when they go from, as we have recently seen in commodities, when they go from not uh, having forward coverage because prices went down and they kept falling and they say, I don't want to own it, to and then it going up and they say, I want to be protected against it going up. That movement causes a lot of buying and so on. So that's a buyers that have extended those forward purchases are an indicator that I use. This table here that I'm showing shows for the stock market as a whole, those items that, you know, are we in a bubble? Is the stock market in a bubble? Well, I apply that basically that framework to all individual securities. And I do that in a systematic way because my process is to write down the criteria to, to use filters and so on and and try to uh, see which are in a uh, in a bubble. So there are different different stocks. Some are in bubbles. It seems to me some are not in bubbles. And the stock market as a whole is indicated by that table. Let me just go to the next chart. 
So this chart goes back to 1910, and it shows the on an indicator of the degree to which we're in a bubble. You can see that it's bubbly, and it's not as high as the total bubble, but not, not as high as it was in 2000, not as high as it was in 1929, but higher than it was in 2007. Let's take a look at the stocks that are in a bubble. A lot of stocks are not in a bubble uh, according to those criteria. So this goes back, uh, back to 1995, that chart, and it gives you an idea. So this is the first chart is the share of the top thousand charts that are in a bubble. Um, and so it's been about 5% or the share of the S&P 500, about 2% by comparison to those in 2000. Again, not as high as the 2000 bubble or the 29 bubble, which were comparable, but higher than 2007. So let's go to the next chart. And this shows with the bubble stocks. I put together an index of those that are bubble stocks. And this shows how they've performed in relationship to the S&P 500. And so you could start to see as we're uh, breaking down the bubble. And I believe that that's likely to continue. But uh, being in a bubble, one of the things is, you know, bubbles can expand and contract and the timing is a big issue. Okay, so why are we in a bubble? Uh, this chart goes back to 1900. And the top chart shows a debt to GDP. The bottom chart in the blue line shows interest rates. And the red line shows the printing of money, the, the amount of money to, uh, that's going in. And so what you can see is when you have a lot of debt, like we have a lot of debt now, and there's a lot of increasing uh, debt, and there's the hitting of zero interest rates in both cases, there's the printing of a lot of money. And that's a key element uh, of the bubbles because they have a lot of liquidity that comes into the market. And then there's a lot of throwing around that money in terms of bidding up all sorts of assets. So you could see that red line. You could see how when the blue line hits zero, uh, interest rates 1930, starting in 2008 and since, we've had that movement. Then you have you see the largest movement now. So a lot of liquidity. A lot of debt financed debt monetization makes for a classic bubble. Other items are new IPOs, with, uh, particularly if they have no earnings, high price to revenue, or in many cases, no prospect of, of making money. Those are bubble considerations too. So I would say you can't say the stock market is in the highest a bubble. You can't even say that it's necessarily in a bubble. You have to distinguish uh, which ones, which stocks um, are in a bubble or have been in a bubble uh, from those that are not in a bubble. There are a lot of stocks that aren't. And um, at that bubble is a little bit like the bond markets bubbles. Of all of them, uh, there's the debt growth that finances the bubbles that happened before it that create the busts. You know, there's basically six stages to it. There's the normal debt growth that finances growth that pays for itself. <clears throat> then you get into the bubble stage when everybody's extrapolating what happened in the past. So asset prices are going up and everybody's borrowing a lot of money to extrapolate what's happened. And that bubble stage, central banks don't pay much attention to because it doesn't affect inflation and growth. And so I think at that stage is when the central bank should be looking at, are those debts going to be able to be paid back from the financial that would be the biggest. Debt has increased, but uh, debt relative to the debt service debt service payments relative to incomes have not risen like they have had in 2007 and, and eight. And you look at the right. maturity of the debt. When we run the pro forma financial uh, calculations, it's nothing like 2007 what looked like to 2008. There's a squeeze at, that, that'll be emerging, but uh, generally speaking, uh, we're in, I would say, the seventh inning of the cycle. I think that we're at the stage in the cycle where interest rates are being raised. Right. We're in the later stage. Probably maybe we have two more years, I would say, into the cycle, right. something like that. Yeah. And then the issues, <clears throat> the issues of this desk crisis are very different than, than the last desk crisis. Right. Each one's a little bit unique. This one looks very much more like the 1935 to 36, 30, 1935 to 40 period.
1929 to 32 and nine and 2008 to uh, 2009, we have a debt crisis and interest rates hit zero. Both of those cases, interest rates hit zero, only two times the century. There's only one thing to do next, and that is to print money and buy financial assets. So in both of those cases, that's what the central bank did, and they pushed asset prices up. As a result, we had an expansion, we had the markets rising, and we particularly had um, an, ex an increase in the wealth gap. Because if you known financial assets, you got richer, and if you didn't, you didn't. And so what today we have is the a wealth gap that's the largest since that period. The top one-tenth of one percent of the population's right. net worth is equal to the bottom 90 percent combined. You have to go back to 1935 to 40. As a result, we have populism. OK, populism is the disenchanted capitalism not working for the majority of people. And we so we have that particular gap. So we have a political gap, the, um, a social gap in terms of the economics. And we're coming into the phase where we're beginning the, the tightening cycle. 1937, we begin a tightening cycle. We begin a tightening cycle at, at this point. No tightening cycle ever works out perfectly. That's why we have recessions. You get, can't get it perfectly. So as we're going into this particular t cycle, we have, we have to start to think, well, what will the next downturn be like? We're nine years into this. As you have a downturn, I believe that there's a political and social implications to that related to populism and less effective monetary policy. There's less effective monetary policy because there are, so far there are two types of monetary policy used. Lowering interest right. rates. We can't lower interest rates. And the second is quantitative easing. And it's maximized its 